Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first seminar of the 2023 GRCF seminar series. This morning, we're delighted to um, have a presentation on the Computational Biology Consulting Core. And with that, oh, uh, let me make a note that you're free to ask questions during the presentation. You can um, post them in the um, Q&A if you'd like. Uh, otherwise, you're where uh, Liliana is happy to address them at the end of the presentation. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Melissa Olson, the director of the Genetic Resources Core Facility, and she is going to introduce our speaker this morning. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our seminar today and part of the GRCF seminar series. The title today is the Computational Biology Consulting Core. Bioinformatic Solutions for Genomic Applications <laughs> by our own Liliana Flore from the Department of Genetic Medicine. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Thank you, Liliana. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I thought I was unmuted, but um, yes. So, so what I was mentioning was, and um, perhaps you found it on the slides that we perform a variety of analyses uh, for a number of I, um, I was mentioning that, that we perform a number of types of analysis on sequencing data generated um, with, with different sequencing technologies, um, as, as, I, as I've shown, and I will be going through each one of them, um, show you the protocol, um, and, and walking you a little bit through the algorithm and method components, and then showing one example of such analysis that was performed um, on customer data. I want to point out here that I will not be delving onto the functional, on, onto the interpretation, biological interpretations um, of results. Um, rather, I want to show the capabilities and deliverables that we produce um, at the core. So the first application that I want to talk about is, uh, um, is transcriptomics, um, in particular bulk RNA-seq. Um, the goal for this type of analysis is to identify differences in gene expression between two conditions. Um, we have a number of questions that are being addressed by analysis. The very first one is, what are the genes and the transcripts that are expressed in this experiment? Then, what are their expression values? And finally, what genes change expression between conditions? So our analysis um, responds and answers these particular questions. The steps of a typical basic RNA-seq analysis are as follows. We start by quality checking and trimming the reads, and you're going to see in red the software that we use to perform this, this type of um, uh, analysis. Um, once the reads are quality checked um, and, and trimmed, we map them to the genome with the spliced alignment software. Um, the aligned reads are assembled into transcripts and genes uh, with, a, um, with a specialized assembler. Once these genes, um, once the gene models are obtained, they are used as annotation for performing quantification of gene expression level and um, uh, finally differential gene expression. Optionally, if um, interest exists, we can perform differential splicing analysis. And finally, the list of differentially expressed or differentially spliced genes can be analyzed for um, um, with gene functional analysis or pathway um, analysis software, such as the publicly available David and Panther um, web-based um, tools. I will go through each step. Um, for the first step, read quality checking and trimming. Um, you will see an example here of the average per base quality for a read. Um, we perform quality checking, looking for primers or a primer or linker sequence, low quality sequence, poly A sequence, anything that, um, that might um, produce a contaminant and might, um, uh, might prevent the read from, from being mapped. This is um, a step that we perform at the start of each analysis, but I will only mention it here, mention it here because it, it gives us a very good insight into the quality of, um, uh, quality of the data and the types of results that we expect. So here you can see um, the green range at the top is the good range, um, the orange um, is um, not so good, and then the poor range, um, low quality values is, is in red. So this read, for instance, this, um, this sample has poor quality bases uh, starting at position 75, um, and they should be trimmed. So here's one um, example where performing trimming has helped tremendously. Um, in this case, you see alignments, results of uh, alignments um, with top hat 2, which is an end-to-end -end aligner, so it requires the read to map uh, fully. Um, we have paired end reads from an FFP, formerly fixed paraffin um, in, embedded um, sample, with the 68 million or so read pairs. 
And you will see before trimming, uh, read one has a mapping rate of only 79% and read two has a mapping rate of 92%. After quality checking and trimming the read to remove those um, poor bases, poor quality bases, you will see that the mapping rate has increased to somewhere around 97%. So we were able to, um, to gain uh, approximately 14 million reads by performing this, this trimming operation. Um, I would like to mention that trimming is particularly is uh, is particular to top hat for transcriptomic operations. Um, it is not necessary for star and high sat two, which are uh, local alignments, local aligners. After the reads are um, aligned, we perform transcript assembly, and there are a couple of reasons why we, we need to do this rather than using um, um, a reference annotation such as Genco. First of all, we know um, from studies that the accuracy of quantification and differential expression analysis depend critically on the quality of the gene and transcript annotations. We need to have a, um, a specific um, and complete um, data set. Um, a, very, a very practical consideration is that the larger the data set, the larger the number of false positives, um, and also the lower the Q values. Um, and, and lastly, um, by performing trans transcriptome assembly, um, the, the transcriptome assembly algorithm um, has a way of analyzing um, and, and removing um, the majority of paralogs, so reducing the po uh, false positives due to paralogs. Transcriptome assembly starts by taking the reads um, that are mapped to the genome and then assembling them um, uh, using two types of information, um, the piles of reads or read coverage along the genome, which are indicative of the exons, and the spliced reads, which provide information about the introns. These two types of information can, can be combined into a graph structure, such as the, the splice graph shown at the bottom, which um, contains an encoded, uh, encoded a representation of all um, of the transcripts. Transcripts can therefore be enumerated, and then a procedure such as um, expectation maximization or a linear program can be used to quantify and assign the reads, and uh, based on these assignments and quantifications, um, to determine what reads, uh, what transcripts are particularly expressed in the gene. So at the end of the transcript assembly, we have a much better idea of what the genes are and what the um, particular transcripts are expressed in that sample. Um, I would also like to mention that we're using a very special assembler. So we used to assemble the reads in every species with a tool such as string tie and then merge them across all the species. However, this resulted in, uh, well, it resulted in good completeness. Um, it, nevertheless, it had very low precision. So precision will go down into, into the teens and perhaps even, even lower. So now we're using um, a different protocol, a simultaneous, um, simultaneous multi-sample assembly implemented in the program Psi class, which drastically increases um, the precision and the efficiency of, of our process. And it allowed us to lower the costs. This will be the output, and, and I, would, um, I would recommend checking the outputs from, from assembly when you receive um, that type of information from, from the core. Um, you will see the spliced reads at the top with the read coverage, spliced, um, spliced reads representing, showing the introns, um, the actual reads, and then the reconstruction are shown in blue at the bottom with the exons represented by boxes and, and horizontal lines being introns. Once an annotation is produced, it can be used to quantify the expression level in each sample and to for perform differential um, analysis. We use two tools, DSIG2, and previously we used to have CAFDIF2. They have different modes of operation. Um, but the goal is to determine st uh, statistically significant differentially expressed features. Um, and the output of such a file is, is as shown here. So um, there's some information about um, the gene, the gene name, um, the locus, uh, whether the test can be performed or otherwise whether there's low data, um, followed by um, the expression values in, um, in condition one, condition two, let's say log twofold change um, and, and so on, and the p-value and, and the q-value. And the DSIG format, this is, this is a format for CAFDIF2. For, um, um, for DSIG, um, the format is similar. Um, optionally, we can perform differential splice, splicing with one of the tools mentioned earlier. Um, the, the goal here is to identify alternative splicing patterns, such as exon skipping, mutually exclusive exons, alternative five prime and three prime splice um, ends, and intron retention. So such patterns that appear to be differentially expressed between condition. And you see one example on the right at the UTRN gene, you see a skipped exon, the um, exon number two. 
And you will see that in indolent um, um, thyroid um, carcinoma, um, the inclusion level is 86%, whereas in met metastatic one, the inclusion level is only 57%. So that is the type of information that you will obtain. As I mentioned, the differentially expressed um, genes list or differentially spliced genes list uh, can then be used and analyzed with uh, tools such as David or Panther to obtain representations of, of um, pathways such as, uh, such as the ones shown here that um, um, are significantly represented among the differentially expressed genes. So these are the types of um, these are the types the steps of the analysis. I would like to illustrate with an example. Um, the project was uh, um, to um, aim to identify changes in gene expression signatures in refra uh, refractory dermatomyositis in response to treatment. Um, the core customer NPI was Dr. Julie Paik um, in dermatology. The data consisted of um, samples from 10 patients over a 12-week course of, um, of treatment and measured at baseline zero weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks, and, and three tissues, as mentioned, for 112 genes. And the goal was to identify differentially expressed genes between selected time points and for each tissue. Um, and I will show you some of the de deliverables. Um, Um, the first step is uh, is to collect to produce the alignments, and here you have an example of alignment statistics that um, of the type that we collect in order to perform a consistency a consistency and quality checks. Um, you see all the samples represented and the mapping rates, mapping rates for read one, for read two, um, and the concordant rate, which means um, the percentage of reads that map correctly in the correct orientation and at, at, at proper distance. Um, very important, we also perform an analysis to see where the, these reads map um, and a portion map to intergenic, um, or they may be intronic, exonic, and um, exonic and intronic, is the last two categories that are important because they um, indicate whether um, correct gene models can be constructed and then quantified. And you will see here that there are two, two samples that had relatively fewer reads, a, a, a smaller proportion of reads mapping to, um, to exons. So those should be um, followed up um, in, in the results. We perform differential expression and we have two types of output. So first we summarize, that's what you see at the top. So for every type of comparison, uh, we show the number of genes. Um, the number of genes remaining when filtering by p-value, 0.5, um, a significance level, q-value, you see that it's a very small number here. So perhaps we should only use the p-value. And then the PI might choose to use another criterion, such as um, a log fold change or maybe the level of coverage. And that's what you see here. So these are all proposed to the customer and the customer decides which one, which one should be used. Um, separately, we have um, the actual genes and the output here produced by DSIC shows uh, the base mean, which, which refers to the coverage, coverage level and can be used to, for the filter. Uh, log fold change. Um, standard expression, finally, p-value and p-adjusted value, which is also um, um, an FDR, false discovery rate. Um, I believe very helpful is this volcano plot representation, which shows all the genes and, and gives a better, um, a better idea about how grouped them um, and, and what, what the correct, um, what an appropriate log fold change cutoff can be selected if interesting. So um, a, a volcano plot shows the log fold change along the X axis and, and uh, it shows the, the P value or P adjusted value along the Y axis. And then um, providing that we use a 0 0.05 cutoff, cutoff um, and, um, and we use a certain cutoff for the log fold change, um, then everything that's outside in the, they're also called uh, bunny ears, or, or everything that's outside of those intervals um, towards the upper left and the upper right corners represent significant values. But this provides an ensemble figure of um, the level of expression changes um, between the conditions. Another way to represent, um, to look at the differences between the samples and, and note that the differential expression um, step only provides a global expression level for uh, all samples in a particular condition. So if we want to observe um, individual um, differences among the samples, a heat map is probably a good instrument to do so. Um, in a heat map, we show um, the samples along the columns and we show the events, or in this case, the genes along, um, uh, along the rows. Um, and there can be clustering based on sim the similarity of um, the samples and also the, um, all the, also the genes as shown here. Um, and as I mentioned, so this can show you further groupings and, and further uh, variation at the, at the level of, um, of sample. 
Um, lastly, we perform a principal component analysis, which can further identify outliers in the data that might need to be removed, um, or that can identify subgroups that would otherwise not be known beforehand and not be observed from the differential expression analysis. So with this, I would like to close this particular portion, if I can. Okay, and I would like to go to the next to the next topic, which is single cell RNA seq. So here, the goal is to determine the cell types and the cell type composition of a sample or an experiment, where an experiment contains multiple samples. Um, and another goal, if we have multiple conditions, is to compare perform gene expression comparisons between conditions. The questions here are, first of all, just like with transcriptomics, what are the genes that are expressed in the experiment and in every sample? Um, the second question is what cell types are present? And um, what are some genes that distinguish among the cell types, um, the so-called markers? And lastly, if we have multiple conditions, what genes change expression between cell types um, and or conditions? So these are the, these are the questions that, that um, a, a single cell RNA-seq experiment must answer. We use the tool SERA in order to answer these questions and the basic analysis, which involves a single experiment, but potentially with multiple samples, um, is shown here. So the first step again is, uh, is cell QC. Um, and um, in this case, we're looking, to, um, we're looking at identifying um, those um, cells and removing those cells that are perhaps empty um, or um, that are du um, duplets and, and, and triplets or that have a large uh, fraction of mitochondrial reads. The second step is uh, pre-processing by dimension uh, reduction. So first there is a process of uh, normalization. Um, the data is, um, is um, the expression data is uh, log transform in order to account for um, control for over dispersion. And then it is normalized to a zero one um, um, distribution. Following this, um, the, um, we, we detect the most variable 2,000 genes, and this most variable 2,000 genes are then used to um, for dimensionality reduction with the PCA. Once the PCA components are identified, and I will be showing examples for each one of them, um, we select a number of PCA that captured most of the variability in the data, and we perform further cell clustering or um, a nonlinear dimensionality reduction and clustering with um, a measure such as UMAP. Um, lastly, uh, once we have the graph, we need to identify, um, and, uh, once we have the graph and the particular clusters, we need to identify, so assign names and cell types to each cluster. And for this, we determine uh, cluster biomarkers. At this step, we work with the PI. The PI is the expert, the domain expert here, and, and can um, um, is, is uniquely qualified to help us identify and, and assign the labels. Um, and I'll show you the type of information that we provide to aid with that. Um, based on this information, now that we have assignments, um, we assign cell type identities to clusters. Um, and finally, we proceed with identifying differentially expressed uh, genes if multiple conditions are present. So here's one example. Um, so um, if I'm saying the naming correctly, I apologize. Um, so um, the project is landscape of circulating immunocytes in the brain in chronic sleep de deprivation. And, and the PI is Dr. Shaoning Han uh, from anesthesiology and critical care. Um, the experiment consisted of four samples, um, four transgenic mice, um, only two were transgenic mice, um, um, mutants of CCR2, um, and, and they were wild type sham, um, knockout um, sham, wild time sleep deprivation, and KO sleep deprivation. They were sequenced on um, with 10x genomics, um, and the results were. Um, between 1,300 and 2,400 cells per sample. The goals here were to produce from our endpoint to produce cell type classifications and cell composition analysis and identification of marker genes, and then to perform differential gene expression between different conditions, um, such as between wild type and, and knockout and sham versus um, sleep deprivation. Um, so here's what the first step would look like, quality control. Um, on the left, you see before filtering, and on the right, you see after filtering, and, and you see violin plots of the number of genes, um, the number of transcripts, and the percentage of mitochondrial reads. 
Um, so the first step um, literally removes removes those genes, uh, removes those cells that have too small a number of genes um, and uh, too large a number of transcripts because they could be triplets and 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 clusters of clusters of genes. And and finally, um, typically um, more than five percent mitochondrial reads. So you see the adjusted violin plots on the right after removing, <coughs> excuse me, the outliers. <clears throat> the second step, as I was mentioning, it is um, is linear linear dimension reduction. And the first um, the first um, part step is to identify the um, the most variable genes by calculating the dispersion. They are shown here in red, and some of them are even annotated. Then, having this um, this information, we perform um, with SERA, of course, um, a, a principal component analysis. Um, as you know, the principal component analysis is a transformation that that um, takes the data, the multidimensional vector that is represented by the by the gene expression level of all genes for each for each cell, and reduces it to a smaller number of dimensions that capture the variability in the data, and it does so starting with identifying um, the dimension, the principal component that explains most, most of the variability. And what you see here on the right is an elbow plot that shows you the amount of variability that each principal component captures. The first one is 12.5, the second one is ab about eight and, and so on. So from this, from this plot, this plot helps us identify a number of, uh, of um, principal components that we can use for the nonlinear transformation in the next step. And that number is typically where you see a bend a bend and, and you see diminishing re, um, returns with um, with more components. Um, so it's somewhere between 10 and 15% or 10 and 20 components um, every in, in fairly every experiment that we've seen. So with this, as I mentioned, uh, we take we take those 10 um, or let's say 15 principal components and we perform non-linear non dimension um, reduction with UMAP. Uh, followed by clustering. And the result is shown here. So um, there are 16 clusters here. Each one of them is showing a different color as, as you're familiar with. At the top, you see all four samples in the experiment represented together. At the bottom, you see them rolled out uh, for each for each type of, um, for each particular sample. Um, it's important to see them that way because for instance, you might see that sample number three here has a larger number of reads. You might also see that um, that this, this seems to have a, um, um, particularly large number um, number of cells, sorry, not reads, cells um, in cluster four that, that is shown here. Whereas you might see a larger representation of, of cells in, in this cluster here, 11 um, for sample one. So such, such uh, representations of the proportions or the, the profile of, um, of cell types for each sample might be, um, could be important and interesting to the investigator. So we have we have clusters, but do we know the names of the clusters, the cell types? We do not know. So for that, we uh, identify markers. There are multiple ways in to identify markers. One of them is using um, uh, an internal SORA function that identifies those genes for every cluster that are significantly differentially expressed when compared to the rest of them of the cells in in the other clusters. So that's what SORA does. Um, but we also point the, the PI to to different um, to different websites. Um, and there's also the domain knowledge that the PI um, herself or himself um, brings to um, bring brings to here um, brings to the analysis. So once we have a set of potential cluster markers or genes of interest, we can produce two types of visualizations. The one on the right shows the maps of expression level, and I would like to point the CCR2, which was um, which was knocked out, and and how indeed it shows that it's it's very very little expressed here and almost almost none. And the second one is with violin plots that show for every, so we have four samples, these are the four colors, and we have 16 clusters. So the clusters are shown along the, uh, the X axis. Um, and the expression level of the, of the particular gene per cluster. So for instance, you can see that CD4 is a very good, it's a very good marker for this particular cluster here, cluster five. Um, so based on, based on um, entirely on, on, on um, assignment by the PI, we can now assign the labels and we can use those in, in further visualizations. And we can proceed with, with the differential gene expression step. Um, so typically there are some there are some clusters that are of interest, but this can be done for every every cluster, that means for every cell type. Um, 
and compare between conditions just like just like we were comparing between conditions for bulk RNA seq and and using essentially the same the same tools the the seq. Um, again, we can produce volcano plots, and here you will see you will see. So this is the 0.05 p-value um, cutoff. So everything, so negative value, so everything above is significant. And then we also have typically the, the PI might, might be interesting in a um in a log fold change cutoff. And in this case, it would be 1.5. So everything that is within this area outside on the left and on the right might be significant. Again, you see that there are different patterns of variability of, of changes between those um, those two conditions, which are of interest to often to, to, um, to the PI. So what I've shown you was uh, a type of analysis for a single experiment that contained a number of samples. But sometimes and oftentimes, um, um, the data might be collected through multiple experiments that are sequenced at different um, at different times. And that brings additional challenges. So here's one example. The, the PI was Dr. Luis Garza from dermatology, and he had um, he had two different experiments. One of them contained the samples A, B, and C, which were transplant, sa transplant samples taken from two different sites in vivo. Um, and then the second experiment had N and V, um, untreated samples um, from the same two sites, but this case in in vitro. Um, and again, they were sequenced with 10, gen 10x genomics. The goals were similar to the previous analysis. Um, um, the goal was to identify the cell types um, and the cell composition, identification of marker genes, and then to perform comparative analysis between the different cell types between N, the in vitro, um, and the in vivo um, comparisons. Um, the difficulty here, however, was that we have data from two different experiments, and then uh, there's the possibility of batch effects. So I will not, I will spare you the time with, with looking at um, and analyzing the data. I will show you, you recognize the clusters here. So at the top is with batch effects, at the bottom is after removal the uh, batch effects. Let's focus on, on the top. So on the left, we show the clusters, but instead of coloring by, by cluster, we color by sample. So you will see that samples A, B, and C are all here on the left. And you can see that the cells from, from N and V, from the in vitro, are all on the right. So this is a typical representation uh, that shows batch effects where the separation is by experiment rather than by, by cell type. And I wanted to show you here because you can see you can see it bigger. So A, B, C are all on the left and N and V are all on the right. Um, and then after performing, okay. So after performing the, um, the batch effect um, control um, and the har harmonization, you can see that they start, um, they start moving and, and there's a certain overlap. So there's still a number, there are still different, um, different cell types in, in the majority because they are different environments, but you can, you can now start seeing that, that um, the, volar, the N and V start overlapping with some of the A, B, and C here. So batch effect, um, controlling for batch effect um, is very important when, com when combining experiments. Uh, so if there are no questions, I would like to go to the next, to the next topic. Um, and that's, um, that's a foray into epigenetics with chip seek and attack seek analysis. The goal here is to determine the interactions between the DNA and the binding proteins. And the questions that arise are, um, what regions in the genome are bound by DNA binding proteins, um, transcription factors perhaps? Um, what are the differences in the bound protein levels between conditions? Um, so that's a variation on, on the um, differential binding. And what genes are these differential sites associated with? So the analysis will answer these particular questions. And the analysis has the following steps. Um, first, aligning the reads to the genome um, and, and performing some QC. Um, they can be aligned with the tools, um, with the tools Bowtie 2 or BWMEM. Using the reads to perform peak calling and then if necessary, uh, if necessary peak splitting with the tool MAX2. Um, then um, identifying um, 
overlaps, commonality, commonalities and differences um, in the annotation of peaks between conditions. So this does not look at the, um, at, at the binding level, but rather it looks at the footprint on the genome. So looking at the overlapping peaks and identifying, identifying as I said, common, commonality um, and differences. Um, then next, and it should be four, detecting differential um, differential peaks, so differential um, binding peaks between two conditions with with the tool that um, with the tool Tor, and finally, once we have a list of peaks, annotate them by genomic region um, and looking for, for instance, for enrichment. So um, I will give one example here. Um, um, epigenetic profiling of a mouse model of Kabuki syndrome, and that is that is the mouse. Um, for many of these, you will see um, a listing of the publication where the analysis um, was was um, was presented. Um, if you'd like to obtain more information, so in this in this case, the PI was my colleague Dr. Hans Bjornsson um, in genetic medicine and also University of Iceland. Um, there were four conditions. Mice, so mutant TAC, where TAC was um, was the treatment, mutant mutant vehicle, wild type TAC, and wild type uh, vehicle, and then there were two types of um, experiments on on histone three um, lysine for um, <clears throat> methyl and and trimet trimethyl. There were fifteen samples for one ex uh, for one experiment, and there were sixteen samples for the other one for the four conditions. So there were essentially at least at least three samples for for condition which allowed um, which allowed comparisons. The goals were to characterize the open chromatin spectrum um, in each condition, and then to compare the conditions um, to identify what the effect of the treatment tap might be. And um, so here's uh, here's an example. So I'm I'm not either I'm missing or I'm uh, oh. So here's uh, here's an example of of the output after performing differential analysis with the tool Tor. So at the top you will see a comparison, um, a comp the results of of, of um, the comparison between um, the vehicle in the mutated mouse and and the wild type mouse. And you will see that that uh, the mutated mouse has a number, a large number of downregulated genes. Um, the representation here shows you the genomic location along the um, the, the x-axis and the fault change along the y-axis. So below the zero line is everything that is downregulated. Above is everything that is upregulated. So the mutant mouse has a number of downregulated genes compared to compared to um, the wild type when on vehicle. Um, when introducing treatment, TAC 418, you will see that there's a significant increase, so more, more than double, um, in the number of upregulated um, up genes and, and only a small increase in the number of downregulated genes. Um, so you see that, and, and um, further looking at, at the nature of the genes and, and, and parallel gene expression experiments, which are, which are shown in this particular, in, in the publication here, um, it can be demonstrated that the TAC four TAC four eighteen um, is rescuing the phenotype um, of the mutant. So that's one kind of uh, representation and one one type of output. I definitely missed one slide. So yes, th this was one slide I was showing you peak detection using using Max two. Uh, so Max two has number. There are multiple ways in which peaks can manifest themselves. There can be um, narrow peaks and there can be wide peaks. Generally, chromatin marks have uh, broad peaks, uh, whereas transcription, factor, um, transcription factors show narrow peaks. And then selecting the appropriate parameters for the tool, for the MAX2 tool, is critical. Um, and the number of options are shown here, that particular locus. Um, from this data, we have four samples. Um, you see the footprints generated by the different options here. And then we decided we, we chose broad, no lambda, because it best corresponded to what we were seeing here in the data. But the important part is that, that choosing the right parameter settings is, is critical and that one needs to visualize this in order to determine what those parameters might be. Um, once we have once we have the, the set of peaks, um, 
identify with Tor, and I want to say a little bit about Tor. So Tor is a very specific tool. It, it implements something that we call a hidden Markov model that identifies three states. Um, basically, it compares um, it compares the um, the level, the peak level um, between the two conditions, and and the three states correspond to conditions of up regulation, um, down regulation, and and to no significant change. It is fast and it allows multiple um, multiple samples, um, and it has a, a number of other benefits um, as well in terms of normalization. So, lastly, once we have a set of differentially um, a set of um, differential binding, differential level peaks, um, we used a, um, the tool Homer to um, assign them to specific genes. And we can further perform um, enrichment or genomic categorization, um, genomic classification analysis, such as those shown here. So for instance, you can see uh, the breakdown of the peaks by the type of genomic region, 5 prime UTR, intergenic, promoter, and, and so on. So those are the types of those are the types of results that one would see, and the types of steps that one, one would see from a chip seek and a tax seek analysis, and we can por perform more and and um, because oftentimes we, um, the PI might have additional questions um, or, or facets that, that he or she would like to explore. So the next analysis that I want to talk about is methyl seek again in I mean meta, in, um, in epigenetics. The goal here, which is similar somewhat to, uh, with with the um, chip seek, is to determine methylation levels along the genome and then to determine areas where the methylation shows differences between conditions. So comparative. Um, analysis, differential uh, methylation analysis. Questions here are um, identify the regions in the genome that are methylated and identify their levels, quantify them, um, the, level of, the level of methylation, then answer the question, what are the differences in methylation levels between conditions and where are the sites? Um, and finally, associate them with genes um, that we can analyze with the tools such as David and Panther for um, for functional or pathway cl uh, classification and enrichment. The steps of a methyl seek data analysis um, are as follows. Um, we start by aligning bisulfide converted, and I will say uh, shortly what it means, reads to the also bisulfide converted genome. These are in silico conversions. Um, we use the tool BSMARC for this operation. Um, then with the alignments, we perform cytosine, cytosine um, methylation state calling, um, again with the tool BSMARC, by analyzing the, um, the alignments. Step three, determine differentially methylated states between conditions with the tool DMR finder. That's one of the tools that, that can be used. Lastly, once we, have, um, when we, once we have such states, we annotate them by genomic, by the type of genomic region, as, um, as I showed earlier, and associate them with genes. And finally, at, um, um, if there's interest to perform enrichment analysis or gene functional analysis. So that's an interpretation step. And here's one example. So to identify differential methylation in hypoxic um, ischemic brain injury, um, the PI was Dr. Ryan Felling, um, neurology. The experiment had 12 mice, six that underwent hypoxia um, ischemia, and six that were sham operated. Um, a whole genome by sulfide sequencing was performed, sequenced on Novasic with a very large number of reads, 350 million read pairs. Um, and I should probably say that it um, that it suffices to, to have about 100 million, um, 150 million um, read pairs. But nevertheless, a large enough, uh, a large enough um, uh, amount so that it covers the entire the entire genome. And the goals are to identify the genes. Um, those were the, um, the research goals. Identify genes that um, undergo hyper or hypomethylation in the hypoxic conditions, including demethylated genes. Um, then to once those identified, to perform gene functional and pathway analysis and, and in some enrichment. So what does the bisulfide treatment uh, have and how does it affect um, cytosines? A methylated cytosine, as shown at the top here on the right, is protected from the treatment, whereas a non-methylated one is converted into uracil. So you see two examples here. In red, you will see the methylated, methylated bases, and in black, you see the unmethylated. So there are two alleles being shown here. Um, following 
following bisulfide treatment, all the seeds, all the um, cytosines that, that were non-methylated were um, converted into use, and the one that was methylated was left as a C. Um, and on the right, there was no methylated cytosine, so they were all converted. So that's, that's the actual process. And then the tool Bismarck um, uses, uses the read data in order to perform two um, to perform two steps, the first two steps. The first one is aligning the reads to the genome, whatever that means, and I will explain that. And the second one to reconstruct the met methylation state level, basically to do uh, to do methylation state calling. Um, so um, we cannot simply align the read to the genome because uh, the read would be methylated and the normal genome would, would not have that. Um, and, and therefore the number, there will be too large a number of differences to allow, to permit alignment. So what Bismarck does is um, it converts both the reads and the genome um, as if converted by, um, by, by sulfide sequencing. So specifically, the input reads are converted in two ways. So um, first, the read is converted to a C to T conversion. And, and then um, if, if this comes from the other strand, um, there's a G to A, um, a parallel G to A conversion. So every input read is now, um, is now represented as two converted reads. Uh, and we do the same with the genome um, and with the reverse genome. So we have four copies, four, four different genomes to reverse and, and to forward, and we have two copies of the read, um, perform all alignments. And then um, at the end, the alignments are reconciled to identify categories um, categories of reads, and I will show you on, on in the next slide. Finally, finally, we have the we have the reads. Um, the read we can um, then revert to to the actual reads and and to the original genome to identify what positions have been methylated um, and what reads have been methylated and uh, and to to quantify the methylation level at, at each um, cytosine. Um, the output, yeah, so, so the output is represented, um, we represent it to a table um, such as here, collected from the output of Bismarck. So we show, for instance, how many reads we started. So that I know that's pretty small. Um, how many were uniquely mapped, and therefore what is the mapping efficiency? So only uniquely mapped reads are retained, um, just as an observation. So that information is at the top for every sample. Every sample is shown along a column. Um, then there's information about uh, methylation calling in the, in the bottom part. Um, the total methyl methylated cytosines um, in CPG context, CAG, and so on. So I forgot to mention, generally, um, the Cs are methylated in a CG dinucleotide. However, there's also possible, methylation is also possible in a, in a CHG context or CHH, where H rep, um, represents a non-G nucleotide. And those two categories are, are typically present in, in brain. Um, so what do we do with this number? We look, we look at them generally. We also compare them across, across the samples to make sure that one sample is not, does not look like um, an outlier. And the percentages here um, of methylated states, um, again, we're looking for um, consistency for, from concordance uh, across the samples. Here's one representation that, that Bismarck presents where um, we see the same information per sample, but now broken down by the types of alignments. So that this looks at the alignments. Each sample is represented with, um, with a column or a position along the X axis. In green, we have the number or rather the proportions at the proportion at the top of, um, of aligned reads that are uniquely mapped. So those are the ones that are used by the analysis and um, they should be somewhere around 60, 70%. In blue, we have the ones that are multi-mapped. So they might have a unique match, but, um, but in multiple places. Ambiguous, which means that we could not select one clear, one clear winner from among those eight that we consider. And finally, unaligned at the top. So this gives us an impression of how good the samples are and whether there's consistency across, across the samples. Now, um, that, now that we have um, methylation, methylation calls, so we know cytos cytosines that, that have been methylated, um, the next step is to identify, to cluster them into genes and to identify such clusters or, or, or regions that are differentially methylated between conditions. And we do that with the tool DMR finder. 
the output that you will see here is um, is typical. So we start. Um, so the total number of um, of regions that were identified by clustering and that are uh, were analyzed is a little over two million. So that's already a large number. Um, the number that were retained based on the p-value cutoff and um, of 0 0.05 and D, D represents the difference between the methylation level. So 0 0.05 or 5%. We have the numbers here. The program has its default at a methylation, at showing differences for a methylation of a methylation level at least 10%. And that's the 41,000 that, that we see here. Um, and next, we see a breakdown of this into hypermethylated areas, hypomethylated, um, hypomethylated ones, and the difference between, between the levels. So you will see that most of them show, most of those sites show relatively small methylation differences uh, between 10 and 20%. And finally, we can use Homer just like before to identify for various conditions or for various samples uh, where these methylated hypo or hypermethylated areas or demethylated, which um, can be defined in this case um, for less than 50% um, methylation level remaining. There, there happens to be a very sharp decrease there. Um, and you'll see that there are not large differences except um, among the samples, except perhaps for, for this one. Um, so this, this breakdown um, is, is by the type of genomic region. And one can perform uh, analysis to identify whether differentially methylated regions are more likely, are enriched in one particular type of area compared to others. In the end, we can take the genes, the associated genes, and we can again perform um, either a David or a, or a Panther analysis. This is the result that Panther would provide with the, um, Panther is a, is a web-based tool. And this is the set um, of, of significant pathways that have been associated with the differentially methylated um, genes. And now, um, if I if I have time, um, so this is the last topic. Um, should I go ahead or, or not? Yes. Yes. There are okay. Any questions at this time, unless there's any questions in the room. Okay. So then I will go. I will go ahead and I will talk a, a little bit about our 16S uh, ribosomal RNA analysis. The goal here is to determine the um, and and to characterize the microbial profile um, of samples of each sample and to compare uh, profiles between different microbial environments. And the questions are first, so what taxa, what microbes are present in the samples? Um, then what is the variability both within samples um, and within groups um, and among samples and, um, and groups? And then lastly, if we have uh, um, different, different environments to compare, what taxa are differentially represented um, between groups or um, between conditions? We use the tool CHIME. Um, to perform this analysis um, entirely, so that the, that is an interactive environment. Um, sorry, that is an integrated environment. Uh, we start by pre-processing and filtering the reads. Um, so oftentimes we uh, we have paired end reads, and these paired end reads can produce longer reads that are more easily recognizable and and mappable um, to a particular taxon um, if they are longer and higher quality. So for that reason, we um, for that reason we attempt to merge, and the merging is. Um, might also perform error correction in the process. Also, um, samples um, and, and reads that um, are low quality are, are removed. So samples, for instance, that have too few reads. So now for each sample, we have a number of um, analyzable reads. Um, the next step is to determine um, organizational taxonomic units represented in the sample. So these are truly taxa, but they are, they are called that way because sometimes they can be organize the novel um, and, and therefore unknown. Um, so for that, um, so that this involves clustering and taxonomy assignment. And I think I have a slide that tells a little bit more about that. Finally, once we have for each sample, a certain microbial profile that shows what, ta what tax are represented and what percentage of read, uh, reads is present for each, uh, we can assess the diversity within, uh, within samples or within groups. Um, so that is called alpha diversity, as well as uh, among samples um, or, or groups, and that is the beta diversity um, also implemented, in fact, as the PCA. And lastly, if we have multiple conditions, then we can determine um, the taxa that are differentially represented among these groups or conditions of samples. Um, and here's one example, just like I've done in the past. 
So this is, again, the publication is shown at, at the bottom, should you be interested in, in, uh, in reading more. Um, it was, um, the project was to characterize uh, rosacea skin microbiome and to identify differences from healthy, um, healthy skin. Um, the PI um, is uh, Dr. Anna Chin uh, from Dermatology. Her data set consisted of 22 cases, 12, um, 12, 22 cases um, split across three different um, types of rosacea, ETR, PPR, and overlapping OVR, and 21 matched age, sex, race controls. Um, um, swabs were taken from bilateral cheeks and nose. There were 83 samples total, and, and the V3, V4 region, um, RNA, 16S RNA region was, was sequenced with Illumina MySeq, um, which resulted in 500, in the minimum number was 511 to somewhere around 126,000 um, reads per sample. These were 300 base pairs um, per then reads. Um, and the goal was to uh, characterize the microbial signatures between patients, between groups, um, look at um, um, alpha and beta diversity, and then compare the microbial signatures between uh, healthy and uh, um, between cases and controls by each subtype. So that is a typical um, 16S rRNA analysis. Um, the first step um, was OTU classification and filtering. As I mentioned, so we performed um, quality check for and, and removed low quality sequences, vector contamination and so on, everything that I've shown you in my very first um, analytical slide. Then filtered the samples that had few, too few reads or uh, that did not have um, a matched control or, or case. And finally, performing OTU classification. There are three ways in which, in which CHIME performs um, cl uh, clustering. So one of them is de novo, where um, the reads are being clustered against each other and clustered by similarity, um, and then assigned to known taxonomic um, units. Um, and this can produce novel, novel taxa, but is, um, is expensive um, in terms of time and, uh, and computation, and it can also produce false positives. Um, another type is by reference clustering in which the, um, the reads are mapped against a known database and green genes is the default database, but we are able to change that. And we have done that for a project in parentheses. Um, so um, that has the disadvantage that um, the advantage that, that it is fast, but on the other hand, it does not allow for novel taxa and, and the um, unclassified read, reads are discarded. And therefore a happy medium is this open reference clustering where the reads are mapped um, against, um, against the reference. And then there's also um, a, a reassembly um, of, of the remaining reads. Um, and finally, the, once we, ha we have taxa, we have a re representation of the number of reads per, per taxon. The taxa with few reads are, are being removed. Um, classification is happening at, at seven levels in the phylogenetic tree from level one in kingdom to phylum and, and all the way to the species. And I highlighted the ones that are usually of interest to, to the PIs, which are phylum, genus, and species. And, and at species, classification at species level is not always very accurate or even possible. Um, in a comprehensive way. This is the type of output that one would obtain from, from OTO uh, profiles at the level of phylum. And you will see a listing of the colors here um, on, on the right with, with the diverse classes. Um, and each sample is represented by a bar. And, and obviously the, the percentage, this represents the profiles with a uh, with proportion of each type of, um, of um, bacteria, phylum. Um, I, I pointed out here actinobacteria, which is the largest, the largest one in, in many of, for most uh, uh, of these, um, these samples, Formicates and, uh, pro and proteobacteria. And as you see, um, there are different ways of, of, um, of organizing them. Um, this, can be, this can be done at the request of, um, of the PI, rosacea free controls and the three subgroups. And this is what a classification would look like at the level of species. So it's a little bit more difficult to understand, but you might remember this, this green as being um, the actinobacteria on the previous slide. So the second type of analysis um, is uh, to identify, is, is to calculate um, the within sample and within group diversity. So that's called the alpha di diversity. And, and later on, it will be the beta diversity. So considering uh, a sample, and we can generalize to a group, one can look at the diversity and can measure it, for instance, by the number of OTUs that are present. And that's 
that's incorporated into a, a measure that's called observed OTUs. But that might be insufficient. So a next level up type of measure would be the Shannon entropy, where which takes into account not only the number of different OTUs, but also the proportion of risk that, that um, belongs to each to each um, OTU. That might also not be sufficient in, uh, in, in all cases because um, some of these, be, because a large number of, of um, bacteria might be related phylo phylogenetically and therefore they do not um, introduce um, significant diversity. So the PD hold three measures diversity while taking into account the phylogenetic relationship of the species. Um, and one can use all three of them um, to calculate to calculate a value that is that is according to that for a sample or for a group of, of sample that's the alpha diversity. Now, one observation that I have um, and one particular problem is that um, if we have more reads in a sample, then automatically the diversity will be larger simply because we're sampling more. So in order to, uh, to harmonize and, and to control, to normalize for, for such effects, we have so-called rare, um, rare, rarefaction curves, um, which essentially select um, randomly select um, the same number of um, the same number of, of, of items from um, from each sample of reads from each sample so that they can be compared fairly and that's what you have here and what you'll see is that um, in the end um, the controls here in red how they position um, they are in between the, the two at the top and the bottom so so their positioning while the value, changes slightly, the relative relationship um, to each other remains the same. So these rarefaction um, curves can show us um, the actual relationships between, um, between diversity among those samples or groups that we're comparing. And, and p-values can be calculated for this as well. Um, beta diversity is, um, is essentially um, the PC, um, PCA. Um, and showing uh, differences, um, differences or other similarities among among samples, based on um, the um, the profile, the uh, the biome micro profile, um, and you see some example here. So, for instance, PC three. So that's PC one. This is PC three. Seems to fairly well distinguish between um, between PPR and controls. And lastly, to perform taxonomic comparisons, we use the tool Metastats, um, which provides a p-value and, and um, um, gives us at every at every level from L1 to L7, uh, gives us those um, taxa that are uh, um, differentially represented between the two conditions that, that we're comparing. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation today. I would like to keep you with this, this slide and in mind, in mind with the kinds of analysis that we perform. This is just a sample. We perform many custom analysis uh, where the PI has a particular problem and we identify software and, and we can build a pipeline to, to solve it. So keep that in mind. Um, I will invite you whenever you have, um, if you have a question to um, email me. Um, and I will be happy to answer and set up a, a session, a consultation to discuss your project and your needs. So thank you very much. Any questions? We have one right behind you, Liliana. Um, you showed a lot of different processes you seem to have one or six steps. I'm wondering if you are someone who's already started your analysis, can you get consultation in any point? Mm, like for okay. example, if you align, use the different aligner, maybe use Callisto Buzz tools. Mm -hmm. um, could you get help at like the post identification point, or get help with doing RNA velocity on a data set you've already done? QC? Okay. So the question is, um, if if you want to do this in the lab, so you want to do that, can you get help from the core at at a certain level? Um, and that depends. So we are definitely not equipped to be to be training. We really cannot. Uh, there's a small percentage of me and there's 50% of the engineers. So we have certain recipes where we, we do that. Um, so not through that. If we, But there are multiple ways that one can handle that. For instance, if, if you want, if that's something you have too large a number of samples and you want a particular step to be done, then we would be charging for that particular step. 
if you want to, um, we also have a consultation. So we have consultations for $250. And, and if you want guidance for one particular step, it can be that way. If your PI is interested in a, in a collaborations and there's something that, that we might be aligned well, we can do that as a collaboration. So there are multiple ways. Um, but um, one thing to keep in mind is that there are, um, it's two of us and, and, and not full time. So we are bound by how much we, we can help. If your department offers boot camp or training, I would say go and take those. Yeah. Are there any other questions? So, I was surprised that um, in your evaluation work, how many of the um, reads can't be mapped? Now, um, have you been able to look at comparable data from Nanopore or from PacBio? Mm. So, so no, I have to say no, because we haven't done many methylation. And again, so we have a small core. If, if I get a chance to, to look at the data, Yes, but I would expect that being short, and I know the nanopore manages to bridge over some some areas, um, and and obviously is going to have a better mappability because they are longer because the reads are longer. Yeah. Also, you're not modifying the uh, methylated base, mm -hmm. so you're reading it both as as uh, a C, but as well as it being methylated. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I I'm. Honestly, I'm, I'm I'm not aware. I'm not familiar with that yet. And for for uh, for um, assembly, mm -hmm. what what sort of um, what do you offer for assembly? So we're not doing large assembly. So um, most of our work is really with transcriptomics, um, with chip seek, attack seek, and and we did a fair number of, of metagenomics. Um, for assembly, we had small assemblies. So for instance. Um, there would be um, a new type of um, a bacterium, okay? So, so that kind, that kind of assembly. And in that case, we just use space. Space has a very good has a very good package. It does very good assembly. It also has very good integration tools um, for looking at the and and the other quality measures. So that's what we yeah we did not use any of the big ones. We will probably send them to you. Um, business owners and deliverables. If so, I know you show up emails to different ways to view your potential gaming version. So, once you're at the point no. where you're using this code for figures and things like that, do you receive the code back from you all or edit? Hmm. So, or so the question is. The question is, if if you're, if you're doing this and, and we have the um the code, do we give the code back? Um, and if the yeah is interested, we can give the code. Yes, okay. yeah. Are there any other questions out there in in uh, virtually? If yes, you can unmute your uh, microphone and uh, go ahead and please ask your question. 